This video made possible by Killer Visual Strategies. Visit KillerVisualStrategies.com. Welcome to you all. A big welcome to our panel. Thank you. It's a fascinating topic, and I wanted to start by talking about content. Many of you started in traditional forms of media. What has podcasting done for you in terms of opening up the canvas on which you can paint these audio shows? I feel like I can paint for a specific person, almost. Um, I've gotten to participate in some exercises where uh, you get to envision who is this for? And also, what are they doing? How are they using this? Um, are they using it on their commute? Are they using it when they're shopping for dinner? Um, you know, you get to really put yourself, you know, use, like project your empathy into the person that this is for and want to grab that person specifically. I love that. And has that changed the way you do things when you compare it to oh, your career in radio? It changes everything from, I mean, marketing is a thing. <laughs> Steve, I'm sure can support me on this, that um, marketing was anathema to public radio for decades. It was just like, we don't do that. And now we do do that, um, especially in the podcast space, you have to. You know, thinking about the art, the theme song, you know, that you want it to grab the person and communicate to them, this show is for you. And a lot of times in public broadcasting, we would be told, okay, now, you know, talk to a person when you're voicing your story. But, um, you know, everything else about the story was about like, okay, this is for everybody. Like, we want everyone to be interested in this. So it's a different way of orienting yourself towards just anything you want to make. I, I think that, that one of the things uh, podcasting and digital distribution allows you to do that's really different from broadcasting, which is where I started, is that it allows you, and, and you, you talked about this, to, to speak to much more diverse audiences. If you think historically about, like, who public broadcasters spoke to, like, there's a stereotype, right? We, we, we basically know the 15 to 30 million people, they tend to be college educated, they're disproportionately white, and it was public broadcasting, but it was, it was leaving out 80% of the public. And um, you, know, you, can, you can see shows that have relatively niche audiences um, gain national traction and, and really grow. And you know, this still sort of fits into the public broadcasting genre, but like 99% invisible, it's a show about design. Right? You couldn't sustain that show in any major market in the country because the audience wasn't big enough. But when you, when you launched a, a specific niche national show, you, you have an audience of, you know, it was 100,000 and 200,000, it's probably now about a half million uh, an episode, and that's sustainable, that works as a business. And so the diversity of content that digital distribution supports is much wider, and I think you know, as a former public broadcaster, I look at public broadcasting's mission, and I think it allows public broadcasters like you to reach much, much more diverse audiences than they have historically by actually marketing those stories to those communities and, and speaking in their voice to those listeners. And it's so liberating because, um, <clears throat> you know, especially like if you have a host who's a woman and she's funny, she will suffer the slings and arrows <laughs> of outrageous sexism and the, and the critiques that are directed towards her voicing and her even her very existence. And it's so freeing as an editor to say, this show isn't for those people. Hmm. Wow. And, and to pick up on that, I think um, what was interesting, when, when we set up this panel, uh, I think, Todd, you said, uh, David, you can talk about traditional digital media. And I had that moment where, oh my God, digital media was traditional. And, and the thing that was uh, so eye-opening for me about getting into the podcasting realm after coming from CNN and Gannett and USA Today, we had so many failures in how we first got into this genre. So we, when the iPod came out and the iPod Touch, you know, God, we were on it at CNN. You know, we put out new episodes. We put out essentially what you think headline news. We did. We cut all the news segments. We we decided we had to be funny, so we we created stood up a unit that did funny news segments. Every one of those failed. Every one of those. Nothing stuck. Nothing. And it wasn't until uh, and I had this epiphany when I listened to Serial, which was. It was first-person storytelling that changed the genre. So you could go into a news story, 
and then say, I believe, I wonder, I think, I'm not sure, which was a complete game change. And I think with podcasting, because it's such an intimate thing and it's in your ears, it's a, di it's a diary type of um, format. And so that's been the biggest eye-opening thing for me as a content creator. I'm going to do something that I can only do on a podcast panel. You need to reposition your mic up a little bit yes. higher, David. <laughs> yes. and, and, and Amira, yeah. you have a really interesting broad view of the landscape based on a lot of the folks you work with, but you also had your own local news podcast in your community. I did, yeah. I mean, it, you know, one of the things I really love uh, about podcasting is as a former speech writer, you know, we used to really aim for what is that zinger line going to be? You know, we used to write and think like, what is the thing that is going to be on the news tonight? Because that is the message that we need to communicate. So you're, you're telling, you know, this immense story in a 30, 40 minute speech about something complex like American leadership, but really you're thinking, what's going to be the 30 second clip that gets carried you know, on CNN tonight? And what's beautiful about podcasting is you can actually get someone to stay for the entire 30 or 40 minutes. And so, you know, what I did with our local news podcast, which is how I got my start, you know, I used to live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I decided to report on the city council election there. 26 people are running for city council. <laughs> so you're like, how do, I, how do I message to the voter how they can choose among these people? So we interviewed every one of them, and, you know, we were able to condense it down into a six episode series where we sort of help people walk through the election. Um, and it was amazing as we got people at the tail end of it who said, you know, I listened to every one of those episodes, five or six hours of really rich information on something as nuanced as a city council election. And that helped me become an informed voter. And before, you know, what you'd try to do is try to get someone to pay attention to a paragraph on a flyer, maybe go to your website. But this way we could actually get these people to communicate their messages for minutes, hours uh, to the audience that really mattered. And that's, that's what's really amazing, is you can capture people's attention for an extended period of time in a way that other forms of media don't necessarily allow for in the way they've evolved. So let's get a sense for what this sounds like through the work of three of our panelists. And we're going to show a, a demo video later of what GLOW does for podcast monetization. But we have a quick video to show uh, with uh, the work of Phyllis and Steve and David. Coming in January 2018, Somebody Somewhere, an investigation into the assassination of Assistant United States Attorney Tom Wales. Have a nice day. God, that sounds like him. Wow, and did he confess? No. Maybe because he didn't do it. Back in 2007, when Barack Obama was running for president, he stopped by Google headquarters. And it's sort of a joke they asked him one of Google's notoriously tough interview questions. What is the most efficient way to sort a million 32-bit integers? <laughs> Obama might have been fed the answer. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, maybe I, I, I'm sorry, maybe. No, 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 I think, that's not a, I, I, I think, uh, I think the, uh, the bubble sort would be the wrong way to go. <laughs> Obama talked about using big data to make government better. Dan Soroker, this engineer sitting in the back of the audience, was smitten. In an instant, the click of a shutter perhaps, the company that pioneered the snapshot, that put a camera in every hand, that reshaped our understanding of the visual world, was basically gone. It's easy to think that Kodak collapsed because of the advent of digital photography. And you'd be partially right. But that's far from the whole story, because it was Kodak that invented the digital camera in the first place. That should have put them on solid footing, but it didn't. I love that this medium allows for an entire podcast about failures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was amazing. I was really excited to get to do that as my first project. And um, I actually, I've been tweeting, amazingly, while I've been up here, um, with the hashtag <laughs> um, GW Summit, uh, and, and I tweeted a link to that. So, um, and, and many more messages will go out about uh, just some of the things that we'll be talking about this hour. That's great. So, Steve, there's a backstory to the clip that we played of yours, and it involves A-B testing. Yeah, so um, I, I did that when I was at Planet Money. It was actually the last NPR podcast that I did. And um, when I was at NPR, uh, we had created, not, not me, but our, our tech team had created uh, an app called NPR One that allowed people to uh, skip stories really easily. And so you got, for the first time in my 20-year career, second-by-second -second data 
about how your story was performing and you could compare it to norms. And we actually wrote two leads to that story um, about A-B testing. And the lead I liked was not the one you heard. It was about <laughs> how it was really frustrating to be overruled by your boss, you know, the highest ranking person in the room. And the data was going to break you free of that. And, and my boss, my editor, was like, no, that's a crappy lead. <laughs> 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 we should use this Barack Obama story. And, and we fought about it. And then we decided, since it was a story about A-B testing, to actually A-B test it. And much to my chagrin, he was right, <laughs> which is horrible. But um, it, was the, it was the first um, piece of radio that I'm aware of that actually used A-B testing to begin to gauge what worked and actually use that to inform the editorial choices we made in the podcast itself. Um, that's, that's one of the things that I think is really interesting about this space. I mean, in the last four years since that was made, there's been more data. Spotify makes good data available. Apple's making more data available. At Google, we, we are working aggressively to make more data available for podcasters as well. But um, as a reporter who worked in this space for years, it was amazing to see for the first time when uh, you wrote a joke and it worked when you wrote a lead and it worked, and more importantly, when you did something and it didn't work and begin to dig into why and make your work better. That's great, and I want to ask him just a bit about exactly what you're doing at Google, because I know that's of interest to a lot of folks in the audience. David, tell us the story of somebody somewhere. Well, somebody somewhere, uh, somebody asked me what I did when I was standing out here earlier, and I, and I could give them the, you know, the kind of the corporate answer of starting a company, but what I really do is investigate murders. <laughs> and uh, that turns out to be a fascinating job. Um, somebody somewhere started when I met with John and Todd one day, probably two years ago, and I said, you know, I, I'm new to Seattle, I'm trying to figure out, this podcasting thing looks pretty interesting. Uh, but I'm looking for a story. I really want to find a cold case. I'd been uh, a former federal prosecutor and uh, had some experience in, in doing that. And you guys mentioned the murder of uh, Assistant United States Attorney Tom Wales, uh, which I knew of in the recesses of my mind, but, but hadn't focused on it 20 years. It's an unsolved, it's, it's the highest profile murder case in the Department of Justice. It's the only federal prosecutor who's ever been assassinated in the line of duty, if in fact he was assassinated in the line of duty. Uh, and our podcast is our independent investigation into that. It turns out that this case, which is uh, simple on the facts, you know, somebody walked up to his basement window and shot him through his daylight basement window. That, that is the story of the murder. But uh, it turns out it's the most complicated case I've ever seen or been associated with. The FBI after 18 years, has 51,000 separate folders on the case, each of which represents an individual lead. And so they have created three times the amount of documents in that case than the Enron investigation, which is the largest white collar criminal case. So it, it, it is a crazy story. Um, it was a great one to land in, so I thank you guys for the, the initiative. And you need to listen to the whole season to find out who did it. <laughs> That's right. it, but there, there's a case to be made, and I know you would probably be careful about stating cause and effect, but your podcast and the reporting that you've done has at the very least kept this top of mind there's among no the public, and there's also a case to be made that it has pushed the prosecutors to do more than they otherwise might have. Yeah, I, I think there's no question about that based on the timing of events. Uh, last year, uh, Rod Rosenstein, who was in the middle of uh, dealing with the Trump-Russia investigation, flew to Seattle to assure the public writ large that they were working hard on the case. Uh, coming out of that uh, meeting, there was actually a woman who was put in a grand jury one week after that. That's the woman who was arrested just about eight weeks ago. So. Um, I not don't under suspicion of the crime, but under Not under suspicion of the related, crime, but under charges. suspicion of lying to that grand jury after uh, Rosenstein came out uh, about conversations she may have had with a hitman. So, uh, you know, I think that's one of the other interesting things about this genre. It, it has the capability of driving the, the news. You're not just telling a story about it, something. You, you, you become a part of the story and you drive action. Uh, so the fascinating thing is you can have these great ideas and 
wonderful investigative journalism, inventive A-B testing, and obviously Planet Money as its own franchise within NPR and public radio, and, and really wonderful ideas in terms of focusing on why things failed. But discovering them by listeners and monetizing them, it's the, then it's the next challenge. It's, it's not enough to just come up with the great podcast. What are you seeing, Amira, in, in terms of what breaks through from a marketing perspective, from an awareness perspective, and then from a business perspective as well? Big question, that's a, that's I know. That's a doozy. Maybe let's, let's focus on, yeah, what, what are you seeing that works? So I think the most interesting thing that, that we see that works in podcasting, which is sort of counterintuitive, is this focus on the niche audience that works really well. So, um, in my pre so I previously started a local news podcast. I also had a podcast advertising business. And one of our most successful podcasts was one called First Mondays, uh, which was a show about the United States Supreme Court, uh, hosted by two former Supreme Court clerks who every Monday went deep in the weeds of what was going on in the Supreme Court. Um, and they were using legal jargon. It was the kind of thing that was only decipherable if you were a lawyer. But they found this rabid base of lawyers who like loved their Supreme Court classes in law school and now are you know, off working on transactional law, but just loved staying engaged. Um, and they did enormously well because they had a small audience that was limited in ceiling, but just loved listening to them every week, would call them with questions. And so advertisers would line up to you know, try to get to reach these people and tell them, you know, you're a lawyer, you need to tell the time, so here's your movement watch. Or, you know, you need a good night's sleep, so here's a mattress. And so, um, you know, the thing that we're seeing that works really well in this medium is being able to find an, an audience that um, wants content that's very specific that you can deliver to them. And those are sort of the most interesting ways we're seeing. We see that sort of across the board in law and fitness. Uh, you know, I got off the phone yesterday with a podcast about how to run an auto shop. Um, and so what's really interesting is like how this medium empowers people who have niche audiences to really try to build their business and be able to reach them individually. I do think before you go to the video that you touched on the biggest issue, which is discovery and monetization and how those connect. Because I think um, one clear learning, at least so far as the independent podcasting universe, is ad-supported media is not going to work. And I think some of the stuff that you guys are doing is, uh, is important to that cause. Thank so, Thanks for the plug. Yeah. Yeah. And, we'll, and let's do that. So let's take it in order, actually. I'll get back to the, the monetization in a second. Tell, tell us about Discovery. Can you explain what you're doing in your role at Google, Steve? Yeah, sure. So the, the first thing I'd like to, to say is that um, you know, I tend to agree that, that ad-supported monetization in audio isn't going to work. And I think, you know, coming from Google, that's a noteworthy thing to say, right? <laughs> yes. So um, I'm really bullish about direct listener revenue. I think, you know, it's, it's worked in the, in the public media space, and I think it is the way that passionate people can support the voices that they want. But I think one of the fundamental problems in the public, in the podcasting ecosystem today is discovery is broken, right? Like, the dominant... Uh, platform is, is the Apple Podcast app. Huge props to them for building this ecosystem. But discovery on, the, on that app is difficult, right? You have to know what you're looking for by name. And so what we're doing at, at Google is trying to open up a bunch of new discovery mechanisms. And we're doing it in a couple ways, but they, they have one thing in common. We're, we're opening up the MP3s, the audio files, and we're transcribing them and indexing them. And so just recently that's made podcast search possible. You can search for a topic in search and write podcast after it, and, and we will give you podcasts about that topic. So we could search for your case, hit podcast, and you'll get that. Or you can search for a podcast about your public radio you know, uh, doppelganger and get a podcast by them, or a country music singer, and you can get a podcast about that person. So, you know, we have a long way to go to make that search better. Um, those signals when you transcribe a, a, an audio file are imperfect, um, but I think it's gonna get better and get better quickly. The other thing that is missing is that sort of surfing discovery mechanism. What's, what's the equivalent of thumbing through your Instagram feed in audio? It really doesn't exist. And so if you look at what drives a lot of radio listening historically, the biggest shows with the biggest audiences have tended to have a format of shorter form stories under 10 minutes long that cover a lot of different categories. That doesn't exist in podcasting because you have to press a button to start every podcast or you have to you know, plan out your playlist. So one of the things we did at our startup and one of the things we're testing now at Google is uh, personalized short form playlists 
that really could act as a discovery mechanism. So uh, stories that are under 10 minutes long from a variety of publishers with an opportunity to actually dive deeper after you hear that story. Um, and, and again, we are indexing that, we're making it searchable, we have uh, an understanding of what your interests are, and we try to match those. At the same time, creating sort of a, a story arc that makes sense, right, that delivers surprise. Um, so, you know, I, I think if, if we can begin to break open the discovery challenges, so people can find the niche, niche communities that they're interested in, and we can combine that with some of the solutions that you're proposing around direct listener revenue, you could see the podcast ecosystem go from what is it now, like half a billion dollars, uh, to grow to something that, that rivals or surpasses what radio is today, which is in the neighborhood of 17 to $23 billion, depending on how you count it. So there's a huge headroom for growth here, and that's just in the US. So let's talk about what you're doing to connect that audience with the podcaster in a way that can provide a monetization model. And I think what Glow is doing is interesting in part because it also is part of this broader trend of subscription versus advertising revenue. So we have the video here, and Amira, if you could just sort of explain what's happening and how it fits into Absolutely. what you do, and hey, it's going to play here. And can we pause before we queue up the video just so I can explain uh, what Glow does and yep. a bit about the monetization ecosystem at large in podcasting. Pause that. So Let's pause for a second. Good. It's yeah. a great start. Um, <laughs> I'm glad it works. <laughs> So the monetization ecosystem in podcasting is really stunning because if you think about it, as Steve said, the entire industry today is worth about $500 million, whereas radio is worth about 17 to $19 billion. So there's just a huge gap in how much engagement you're seeing in podcasting and how much monetization is happening. And by and large today, most monetization happens through advertising. But you're starting to see the growth of a couple of other monetization channels. So one is licensing. So some of the biggest podcasts out there are able to get TV and movie deals. But these are still few and far between, although we're seeing more and more of them. Um, and then there's direct revenue. Um, and what was really shocking to me or interesting to me uh, as I started my own local news podcast is we're able to get you know, a really steady stream of people listening to our show. Uh, but it's a community, right? So it was never going to be big enough on a volume basis to make significant revenue via advertising. And it's not that we were averse to advertising, but it just wasn't going to be enough to pay the bills. And so what I set out to do is I said, let me build an MVP. Like, let me test to see whether or not we could build a subscription local news business out of this podcast. Um, and as I turned to do it, I realized the tools just weren't out there. It was really, really difficult to do to build a paywalled podcast or even a podcast that was, <coughs> excuse me, supported via direct listener revenue. The closest I got was putting up a Squarespace page where people went and con contributed. And as I talked to other podcasts, I found that they were facing similar issues. They wanted to get direct listener support. Listeners told them they were willing to pay them, uh, but they just didn't figure out an easy way to do this. And so that was the birth of Glow. So you know, I'll, now I'll walk through sort of what, what Glow does, which is we want to make it really easy for podcasts to be able to create a membership model. And we do that by working cross apps, so we don't make sure make people sort of married to one app. So the way it works is if you're listening to this podcast, listeners might hear you. This is acquired. They have two regular episodes a month, Seattle-based podcast. They say for $5 a month, click on the link in the show notes, um, and you can become an acquired limited partner, which means you get access to two bonus episodes a month where you can understand you know, what is going on in VC. Pay super quickly, which is a problem podcasting. We use Apple or Google Pay, so we don't need people to create a login or anything like that. It takes you to a list of podcast players. You hit Apple Podcasts if that's where you want to listen. And then you go back to your player, and you see the bonus feed right next to the regular feed. And so now, uh, quicker than I could even explain it, you see the bonus episode appear right next to the regular episode in your feed. So Acquired, that was our first client. They implemented this system about 10 months ago. Uh, and what did they see? Well, like I said, they used to issue two regular episodes a month, solely advertising-based. And now they have two bonus episodes a month uh, that are supported via direct monetization. If you look at the unit economics per listener, on an advertising basis, Acquired makes 93 cents a year per listener. That's advertising alone. Now, if they can convert that listener to a subscriber, they're all of a sudden making 
$60.93 off that listener. So they've been able to expand the margins that they are able to get off that one listener dramatically. Now, even if you amortize that over all their listeners, their unit economics on average per listener today is about $4. So they've been able to quadruple the amount that they make over all their listeners by instituting direct monetization. And we're seeing that grow over time. And, and this is a, a model that's still early, but we're seeing expand incredibly rapidly in podcasting. And I think you'll see more and more of this habit of wanting to support your favorite podcasters or even being willing to pay for pod, uh, pay for content no it's, it's exciting to see that um, come out I think it, I think um, particularly for shows that are uh, like some of the shows that you have where you can do the bonus content uh, um, you know st shows that are story arcs and that uh, you know you can force some bonus content but the cream of the content is going to go into the primary feed I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that have you had any success in making that work in, in more uh, broader storytelling? Or is it too early? It's too early to tell. So the, the most interesting sort of examples of this are a lot of people point to China. And there it's really common for, let's say, someone to issue the first chapter of an audiobook or a series uh, under free, get people hooked, and then get them to pay for the rest of it. And so we're just starting to see the beginnings of these models uh, happen you know, in the US. And we're starting to test with a few of them. But we're still waiting on results. You know, what's great is we can help people experiment with what, with what works. And we call that helping them find content market fit. Right? What's your audience want? How do you build a business around them? I mean, in a true pro crime podcast, you can you can imagine a scenario where they 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 drop the first eleven episodes of Serial and, and are like, hey, for a dollar, you get the final yeah. episode, right? <laughs> now that could really backfire, that could. right? The, the ransom but, approach, but it's those kinds of experiments <laughs> that I don't think we've been able to do and and are certainly worth doing. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, I, I am a person who, you know, like I Patreon some podcasts and I'm like, oh, if only it was that easy as what you just showed. So I think that's really cool what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. What I'd like okay. is to have the spectacular failure of the event in my life. So I would subscribe <laughs> yeah. to spectacular failures and become a member and then you would come out and document just <laughs> a <personally>. disastrous weekend. <laughs> How about that? I got you. Okay. All right. <laughs> that sounds like fun. You, I think we would all subscribe. For yes. That. Yes. I know many people in my family who would. So, do you see opportunities day to day to create customized content for super fans? Because that's essentially oh, what you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm on the consumer side of some of those. You know, like I said, I so there's this um, podcast. You'll get the link to it later if you're following me at the. Uh, event hashtag here at the GW <laughs> Summit. Um, but that, one of my favorite types of podcasts is like the, the like buddy in your phone, like the chat podcasts. And there's this one I subscribe to um, about um, D-list celebrities called Who Weekly. And they have a whole separate feed that you can Patreon um, at, at five bucks a month. And it's, it's, it's the stuff that super fans would eat up. It's just silly. It's like over the top ridiculous. And I feel like there's, you know, anything that creates that affinity like that, you only want more. Um, so I feel like when it doesn't create an ethical hurdle, because um, the editor in me is thinking about like, okay, if you were to do a, a true crime one, but there was a paywall for one episode, that could create some ethical and legal problems um, that you would not want to grapple with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I think that for things that are, um, you know, that have that strong affinity thing, and when it's all fun, that would be amazing. For the panel, how are smart speakers, specifically Amazon Echo, and in many cases, the, the Google Hub and Nest devices, changing what you do, how you think about things? Are you, as you're envisioning the person listening to the shows, thinking about somebody listening through Alexa or Google Assistant versus in their ears? Um, I, I, think, I think smart speakers allow uh, a couple things that are really interesting to happen. People tend to listen when their eyes and hands are busy and their minds are curious, right? And so a lot of the podcast product design that's gone on has, has keyed in on visual cues. Like that's where you make your decisions and it's really hard to do when you're going for a run or you're cooking, right? And so being able to seamlessly ask for what you want and get an answer is potentially game changing. The other thing that I think is really exciting is it opens up the, the possibility for interactivity. Um, when I was at Planet Money, I always wanted to ask our audience, 
Uh, what are the worst financial decisions you've ever made? And then just roll tape, right? And I can take the rest <laughs> of the year off. <laughs> and, and, and so creating these moments where you can be the voice in someone's ear, it can be incredibly intimate, but they can actually interact with that experience is potentially groundbreaking. There is no platform out there today that really allows producers to, to seamlessly and easily create those choose your own adventure experiences or to enable interactivity, but I think we're on the cusp of that. And I think when, when we get there, people like Phyllis are, are gonna have a field day. <laughs> oh yeah, Steve knows I've been, I've been champing at the bit on this for a while, uh, but I think it was a couple of years ago I started asking my employers, uh, whoever I was working for at the time, like, are we getting into this space? You know, I want to be there. And uh, I was always met with this, uh, like, opaque wall. <laughs> so I could not ever quite tell what, what was going on um, for my company in that space. But I'm very eager to do it. Everyone I work with knows that I want to get into that. And it's partly inspired by just seeing how my son interacts with his smart speaker. Um, he wants it to do more. And I, I would love that. I would love to be in that space. It would be, it would be really fun. And on a, on a technical level, I think one of the issues is if you compare the web to RSS feeds, right, they're really different. And the amount of interactivity that's possible on the web with hyperlinks and being able to actually jump from one document to another, just that, that doesn't exist in RSS feeds as they exist today. If, if you think about what we're, we're doing at Google by transcribing, one way to look at that is we're making a fake web doc in the background. And so I think there's a, there's a way to go forward here that, that could create an open ecosystem for more interactive audio that would be really interesting. One thing to note, though, is, is it's still incredibly early with smart speakers. So I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but a surprisingly small percentage of podcast listening happens on smart speakers. I want to say it's in the single digit percentage points. And so there's still a lot of innovation to go, and a lot of it has to do with trying to figure out the right way to promote interactivity with your smart speaker uh, in a way that's just harder uh, than it is on your phone. I want to get some practical tips for entrepreneurs in the audience or business owners or uh, product people who might be thinking about going into this space. First off, should the average service provider entrepreneur out there do their own podcast? Would you recommend it as a way to serve a community, bring an audience in, and do other things with that audience? How do you think about that? And, or, I, or there's too many. I feel like no matter what you're doing, you have to know why you're doing it and who it's for and how they're gonna use it. And you also should know when to stop. How am I gonna know this isn't doing what I want it to do? Um, so I think there are creative, um, you know, like content-driven ways to think about that. There are business-driven ways to think about that. But it's like, I feel like you shouldn't, as, a, as an entrepreneur, just feel like, oh God, I have to be in the podcast space too. I have to do a podcast. You have to think about, you know, why, who is this for? Like there's a podcast about elevators like if you stan elevators, I'm sure that that's like your show. Um, but he also might, the host might know, okay, how am I gonna know this isn't working anymore? Um, you know, so it, it, you wanna ask yourself those kind of questions without just feeling like I have to, because it's kind of like feeling like you have to have a blog like in the 90s, you know? No, you don't, you know, but you should know why you want to be doing this. Uh, and I do think that if you, are, if you did want to get into this space, know that um, you have to come in with a vision of a story and telling a story. I think why your podcast is so interesting, it doesn't just tell you, or your former podcast, you know, it didn't just tell you the new, it had all that buildup. It had that Obama clip in the beginning, and it has, it, any good podcast brings you into a story that's independent of what they're trying to tell you. And it involves characters and people and... So if you just put out a podcast on how to, you know, um, you know, run an elevator up and down a building if you were the elevator operator, right? That's not what it's about, though. <laughs> <laughs> that was a slight dig. No. But, but it has to be about, a, it, you have to tell a story. Yes. And it's the character driven that drives that, as opposed to the how to do whatever it is. Absolutely, yeah. It's about elevator news. So things that go wrong with elevators. Yeah, it's fascinating. I did a podcast that compared elevators to self-driving cars. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, but I think, I think audience acquisition is huge, yeah. right? Like yeah. knowing where your audience is going to come from and how you're going to get it because discovery is still broken. Google is still a small player. And, and I wish that Amazon, for all the Amazon people out here, right. one of the things that uh, is missing in podcast discovery is customer ratings in the sense that discovery can be sorted and filtered by customer ratings. Right now in Apple, it is just top, top charts but not associated with customer ratings. That's a, big, a huge miss. Uh, for somebody to step up and maybe maybe to your speaker thing, maybe there's a way to get, tell me the highest rated podcasts, uh, blah, 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 blah. Or, or if the top charts and who knows how they put them together included right. like completion rate for the podcast, right? Right. Like, Word. Yeah, and I was, oh. I was thinking about, um, you know, just what you're doing, Steve, with the um, transcription and opening up just different modes of discovery. I think that's so important because um, do you guys know about this prank a few weeks ago that um, Instagram was taking away the like? And it just made me think about how dependent we are on specific um, apps and how they have things set up and how that drives business. Um, you know, like it, Instagram models and photographers were PO'd when they thought this was real. And they were like, that's it, I'm quitting Instagram then, screw it, I don't need, you know, if it doesn't have likes, what is there for me? And that got me thinking about the, the Apple Podcast ratings, um, you know, and, and the, the charts and how they're, you want your content to be accessed in ways that aren't so dependent on systems like that. So I am gonna push it a little bit, and we do have time for a couple questions if folks wanna line up there, but to, to, to your point, Steve, I know a tech company that has a podcast player and does discovery and could present results based on engagement and time listened. Is that what you're going to do? I can't talk about future roadmaps. <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, I mean, look, Google, Google uh, is, is really interested in audio. It's clearly an area that we're behind in. And, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for, for us there. Um, you know that that Android ecosystem is enormous, and just getting getting the, uh, a great first-rate podcast app installed on every Android phone would do more to expand the market than almost anything else you could do. And then I'd be remiss if I did not point out the major exits that took place last year in this space for the investors in the room. Uh, Gimlet uh, being acquired, uh, of course, many people know that uh, company through the the podcast startup and Alex Bloomberg with Planet Money Roots. Is this a smart bet? Is this a good place for investors to put their money? Uh, we won't hold you to it. No SEC violations up here, but, but how, how bullish are you on this space economically? I'm incredibly bullish. I wouldn't be you know, placing uh, you know, sort of my career bet on it. Um, I think there's, there's sort of four different ways you could think about sort of how the market looks. Um, you know, one is content, one is analytics, one is monetization. Uh, and one is sort of hosting and distribution where you put your podcasts. And I, I guess the question is, you know, is content a smart bet for, for Spotify? And if you look at the economics, it makes incredibly compelling sense for Spotify to place bets on content because, you know, whereas they used to uh, have to pay, or for music, they have to pay out a licensing fee for every stream. When they actually own the podcast content, they can turn all that into margin after they've played sort of the upfront, uh, the upfront cost. And so I think they're going to continue to make content acquisition bets, and they'll probably see other platforms do so as well. It also differentiates the product, right? Like the music labels are going to sign deals with other places like YouTube. They have. And, and if, if Spotify has a, an Alex Bloomberg podcast that you can only listen to there, you know, that's another reason to keep your subscription. So that's great. Yeah, I, f I feel like whether it's called podcast or not, you know, like now blog seems like kind of an antiquated term, right? Like maybe in a few years we won't be calling it the podcast business anymore, but the business of creating things for people to listen to, I'm, I'm bullish on that for sure. I, I'm actually super bullish on, on podcasting as content play on the, on the sort of the, the business infrastructure of things that, that you're doing. But beyond that, I think if you look at the history of computing, um, from uh, 30,000 feet, right? We had uh, giant computers, the ANIAC, that filled rooms and that were very difficult to program. Uh, then we got punch cards and the computers got smaller. We got, uh, you know, a, a desktop design like Windows and they got smaller still and then we got touch screens. And with each step, computing became more ubiquitous and more intuitive. 
human beings evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to talk to each other, it is the most natural form of communication for our, our species. And voice computing has the potential to be ubiquitous. I, I feel like ultimately this is the end state for computing and the, the companies and institutions that really crack that and make this incredibly deep personal content accessible, but also are able to give you sort of augmented reality experiences. So they give you your driving directions and they give you suggestions about where to go. That, that I think, is the future of where computing will go in the next you know, 20 years. Can I give you props on one more thing that you guys are doing with your transcripts? Is I feel like um, something that I've been bothered by um, throughout my career is that it's accessible only to hearing people. And I really appreciate that you're doing something to make what we, we create more accessible to everyone. So thank you. We have a lot of work to do. Nice. This is great. I could talk to all four of you for hours, and I've actually got a bunch more topics, but watch this. So I am going to follow up with each of the panelists and ask them what was to be my final question, which is their top three to five podcasts that are not their own to listen to. We are going to distribute this session as an episode of the GeekWire podcast. You can find it on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. If you subscribe, I will include my thoughts at the end with the recommendations from each of the panelists. So th don't, don't leave me hanging on this. No. So, so subscribe <laughs> to the GeekWire podcast. <laughs> we'll distribute this. <laughs> yes, it'll, and right, exactly. Bonus content on GLOW. And uh, I, I want to give a, a big thanks to Amira, David, Steve, and Phyllis. Thank you all for being Thank here. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah.